Japanese is spoken by 128 million people, mainly in Japan, where it's the official language. It's also spoken in diaspora, mainly in China and Korea. It's a member of the Japonic language family, along with the dying Ryukyuan languages of the Ryukyuan Islands. No one's really sure of what other languages Japanese is related to. Some say it's Altaic and is related to the Korean language, but this is widely discredited among linguists. Some say it's Austronesian, making it related to Indonesian and Filipino, and some say it's related to Ainu, spoken in the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido. None of these theories are widely credited, though, so people mainly class Japanese as a language isolate. Not very much is known about when Japanese started being spoken in Japan. The first major text we've discovered date to the 8th century, and Japanese had undergone heavy Chinese influence since the establishment of the first state of Yamato. The oldest form of Japanese Japanese is called Old Japanese. This is still a period of Chinese influence, especially from Buddhism imported from China, and Japanese adopted the Chinese writing system. The earliest Chinese texts show influence in Japanese grammar, like putting the verb after the object, unlike putting the verb before it in Chinese. Old Japanese was also written using the manyogana system, in which Chinese characters were used for their phonetic value rather than their actual meanings. In other words, the word sakana, meaning fish, would be written with the characters sa, ka, and Na, even though it literally means assistant, fire, and take. Because Manyongana took a lot of effort to write, it simplified drastically in the 8th and 9th centuries into the two main syllabaries used today, hiragana and katakana, collectively called kana. At the time, kana was mainly used to annotate kanbun texts. The kanbun system was another way of using Chinese characters alongside Manyongana, and it was the usage of Chinese characters to represent the meanings of Japanese words, essentially the same as Chinese, just read in Japanese. Kana would be written atop or beside these characters to give the reader an idea of how to pronounce the character in Japanese. Because of how many Chinese words came into Japanese, kanji had up to two different readings, the onyomi, which is its Chinese pronunciation, and the kunyomi, which is the native Japanese pronunciation. The environment in which the character is written in gives away whether the character should be read with its onyomi or kunyomi reading. When Europeans visited Japan for the first time in 1543, a lot of Dutch loanwords came into Japanese, like garasu from Dutch klas or kohi from Dutch coffee. Then came the Edo period in which Japan went under a period of isolation from the outside world. The capital of Japan was moved to Edo, modern-day Tokyo, and the Edo dialect became standard across Japan. Then when Japan entered the Meiji period, Period, more compound words are created from Chinese onyomi characters, creating onyomi compound words. But enough about history, let's have a look at Japanese script. Scripts. Japanese has three scripts. Hiragana, katakana, and kanji. Hiragana and katakana both evolved from the manyogana writing system, and kanji is the interpretation of Chinese characters in Japanese. Hiragana is used to spell native Japanese words, and katakana is used for foreign words for the most part. As I mentioned earlier, kanji can have two interpretations, the native Japanese kunyomi reading, or the Chinese onyomi reading. The kanji would be read as its onyomi reading if it's in a compound with another character, and it's usually read as kunyomi if it's just a single kanji or if it's written with kana sticking out of it. This character this character in this word would be read as o, as in oki, and this character in this word would be read as sko, as in skoshi. They're read as their kunyomi readings, as they have kana sticking out of them. But when you put these two characters together, it isn't pronounced o suko, rather tasho, because now that two kanji are next to each other, they'll be read with their onyomi readings. Japanese phonology is quite simple to grasp. It has five vowels, and each vowel has a short and long variant. The vowels are all pure, meaning they can't be turned into diphthongs. The vowels are never fronted and are never reduced, like how they sometimes are in English. Japanese has a syllable structure of CVN, meaning that a syllable is always either just a vowel, a consonant in a vowel, or a consonant, a vowel, and a nasal. This nasal is always n which in the kana syllabaries gets its own character. Japanese has a pitch accent system, which not many learners tend to pay attention to. Pitch accent is when a syllable in a word is accentuated, usually by being pronounced at a different tone, but it isn't stressed. Pitch accent can change the meaning of a word. For example, hashi means chopsticks, with the first syllable being accentuated. But if you say hashi, it now means a bridge. So what's Japanese's grammar like? Let's start with nouns. Nouns in Japanese aren't marked for definiteness, gender, or number. That means the word hon can mean book, a book, the book, books, or the books. Japanese doesn't inflect nouns for cases, but Japanese does have case particles. The three main particles are the topic marker wa, the subject marker ga, and the object marker o. The topic and subject marker get confused a lot, 
but you can think of it as the topic marker indicates what's being talked about, and the subject marker indicates what's carrying out the action. For example, in a sentence like Zō wa hana ga nagai, Zō means elephant, and is given the topic marker wa, meaning elephants, is what's being talked about. Hana means nose, and is given the subject marker because they carry out the action of being long. You can translate the sentence as as for elephants, their noses are long. Verbs in Japanese are never conjugated for person, but they are for tense, aspect, mood, and politeness. First, Japanese has a copular de or da in the casual form, which is something equivalent to the English verb to be. For example, hea means room, and we can turn it into a sentence by just adding this. Hea this. It's a room. Verbs always come at the end of the sentence, and Japanese sentences only require the verb to make a full sentence. For example, just saying tabeta means I ate and is considered a full sentence. Verbs are also conjugated for politeness. A verb in its dictionary form can be used as the casual present form. So something like tatsu, meaning to stand, can also mean I stand in casual speech. But to make it more polite, you can say tatsimas. If we conjugate this verb tatsu, we'll get a table that looks something like this. To make the polite form past tense, we turn mas into mashita, going from tatimas to tatimashita. As for the casual conjugation, it turns from tatsu to tatta. This is what's called the verb's ta form. Verbs can have a lot of different forms, but I'll talk more in depth about these in a bit. Japanese verbs are highly agglutinative. I touched on this in my last video, but agglutination is when you add multiple affixes to a root word and build them up to get really long ones. For example, let's take the verb taberu to eat. We can add suffixes by taking off the ru ending. For example, if we add saseru, the verb now has a causative meaning, to make someone eat. Taking off du again, we can add daderu to give the verb an abilitative meaning, so it all means to make someone able to eat. Tabesasedareru. Now let's add tai to get tabesasedare tai, giving the verb a meaning of I want to make someone be able to eat. Already the word is quite long, but we can still add more. Let's say we want to negate the verb. We take off i and add ku, which can connect the verb to nai, which negates the verb. So, tabesasedare takunai means I don't want to make someone able to eat. And if we make this past tense, we get tabesasedare takunakatta. I didn't want to make someone able to eat. Moving on, you can see that Japanese has a lot of verb endings, and by a lot, I mean a lot. Taking the verb hashiru to run as an example, we can attach it to suffixes to get meanings like hashitai, hashisugiru, hashitsuzukeru, hashiyasui, hashinikui, hashinaosu, hashiwasureru, hashinagara, hashite kudasai, hashiru youni, hashite miru. hashite yukatta, and so many more. Verbs also have a lot of forms, including the ta, te, and knife forms. Depending on what the verb is, the rules to make these forms can vary. I'll be demonstrating two of these forms with the verbs hashiru to run and the verb nomu to drink. These verbs conjugate these forms differently. The ta form, which is hashita for to run and nonda for to drink, is mostly used to form the past tense. For example, gakusei wa gakkou ni itta means the student went to school. Notice itta is the ta form of the verb iku to go. The te form, hashite and nonde, usually shows that the verb is in conjunction with another verb. For example, hashite can be attached to a verb like iku to get hashite iku to keep running. It's also used in forming polite commands with the word kudasai, like in hashite kudasai, meaning please run. There's a lot of other forms, but I don't want to bore you to death, so you can research about those if you want. The verb suru, to do, it can be attached to nouns to make them verbs. For example, the word benkyo means study, and adding on suru makes benkyo suru, making it a verb. We can do the same to denwa phone to get the verb to call someone, denwa suru. Now that we're done with verbs, let's have a look at some example sentences. Byouin ni ittara tanaka-san ni deatta. Byouin means a hospital, and the two characters byo and in are read with their onyomi readings as it's a compound onyomi word. The particle ni means to, and it can also mean in or at. Ittara is from the verb iku to go, and it's put in the ta form, to which we add da to make it the past conditional. This can be translated as when I went to the hospital. Then, tanaka Tanaka-san is a name meaning Mr. Tanaka, and is also given the neat particle, and the verb deao means to come across or to meet by chance. The verb ao on its own means to meet. Altogether, this sentence means, when I went to the hospital, I came across Mr. Tanaka. Jiko shoukai wa nihongo de nakereba narimasen. First of all, jiko shoukai means a self-introduction. Jiko means oneself, and shoukai means an introduction. This term is given the topic particle wa, as that's what's being talked about in the sentence. The particle de 
on Nihongo Japanese means using or by, so you can translate it as in Japanese. Nakereba narimasen is an expression meaning it must or it has to be. Nakereba means if you don't and is the conditional form of the verb nai, meaning to not be, and narimasen is the polite negative form of the verb naru, which in this case means to be completed. So it literally means, if you don't, that'll be no good. The whole sentence means, your self-introduction must be in Japanese. Finally, let's dissect one massive sentence. Ame means rain, and we have the verb agaru, which usually means to rise or to enter, but as we're talking about rain, it actually means to stop. Ame is given the subject particle as it's the one doing the action. This particle, to, has a lot of uses, but in this case it means and or and then. So far we have rain stops and then. Kodomo means child and although this noun can be assumed as a plural too, the word tachi acts as a pluralizing suffix. Wa is the topic particle, meaning the children is what's being talked about. Jugyo means lessons and is given the object particle, meaning it's receiving the verb of the clause. I'd like to note that the object of the sentence isn't always marked with the object marker. For example, saying nikuto sakana ga suki desu means I like fish and meat. You'll see the subject marker ga on sakana, fish, so someone may accidentally translate it as meat and fish like something. It's just something to keep in mind. Anyways, wasureru means to forget, and it's put in the te form, which is the connecting form. We can translate it more as forgetting. Now we have rain stops, and then children, forgetting their lessons. Hi means sun, and no is a possessive particle. Ataru means to touch, to be stricken, or to face. It's in its te form, and adding on iru makes it a continuous action, an action that's ongoing. It can be translated as sun-faced, or sun-touched. Mizutamari means a puddle, and again has the possessive particle no after it. Yuwaku means a temptation, so linking them together through the possessive particle, it means the puddle's temptation. Muchu means absorbed in, or forgetting oneself, and naru means to become, as in becoming absorbed in, or giving in to. This particle ni means to, in terms of a direction or a state, so this clause can now be translated as giving in to the temptation of the sun-faced puddles. Now that we've dissected the whole sentence, we can say in English it'd be rain stops and then children, forgetting their lessons, give in to the temptation of the sun-faced puddles. So that's all for today. My next video will be about what the impact on language would be if the British Empire never existed. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.